been to Agne. There you are again. Hi, hi, good at life, me. I love that. Wow. Um, R W E I N 96. How are you? Hey, hey. Story Media, Natalie Castillo, and 48 others all at the same time. Hi, everybody. What's today? It's midweek, it's uh, hump day. Uh, maybe some of you got, oh, Catherine Schwarzenegger. Hi, I'm here. Hi, honey. Hi, David. Hi, TV Hair Boy. Oh, that's a good name. Hi, Maria. Love you. TV Hair Boy. That's great. I, I should be TV Hair Girl. <laughs> that's great. Uh, anyway, welcome, everybody. It's Wednesday. We're halfway through. I hope uh, some of you get the Sunday paper midweek. I hope that reminded you that you are right where you are supposed to be. Uh, this morning we sent out a midweek, uh, which we do every Wednesday, and I hope it reminded you that with all of this chaos and with social media, many of us can end up comparing ourselves to others, feel though as though we're behind others, not doing enough, and I want to uh, remind you that you are exactly where you need to be. You're right on time, you're doing great, everything is good. My daughter just said she loves my top because she loves it because this is a, another one of her hand-me-downs. So I am a hand-me-down girl and I get the hand-me-downs from my daughter. So there you go, Catherine, thank you so much. Um, anyway, there we go, that's that. But anyway, somebody said I love the Sunday paper midweek. So uh, I hope that that reminded you to keep your eye on your own path stay focused on what you're doing don't worry about everything that everybody else is posting you're right on time right where you need to be and just keep following your own path try to stay above the noise and try to do your best and try to always heal yourself and look for ways to interact with others from a positive calm space and that's where i'm really excited uh, today Oh, there's somebody who says that they have three sisters and a mom and they share all their clothes. Uh, wow, that's good. Christina, we can share all our clothes. Remember that, okay? We can't share shoes, but we can share tops and we can share leggings. No? Oh, we can share makeup. That's No, we can't even share makeup. Okay, well, we can share something. Anyway, um, I'm really excited to be talking to King J. Barnett today. Why? Because I'm super interested in anybody who uses their platform to heal others. And I've been following him. Uh, Charlemagne the God introduced me uh, to him um, without him even knowing it. Said, you know, you should follow this young man. He's a, a former athlete. He's out there in the black community uh, trying to heal men. And he's talking truth to power. He's using his platform for good. So I started following him um, and watching what he was doing, listening to his voice, watching his posts. And I was so impressed with him. I particularly watched one post where he talked about uh, the importance of alone time and having the strength to be alone and be confident enough to be on your own. And I thought that was really good. And he talked a lot about, he talks a lot about the father wound, the mother wound, and the importance of what it means to be a man in 2021. And I've just been so impressed um, with how he uses his voice. So I thought it would be great. Somebody says, bring on Christina. I, I would love to bring on Christina, but she never wants to come on. So that's that. But uh, one, day. Oh, one day, she says. But today I'm going to bring on uh, King Jay Barnett, uh, otherwise known as Jay Barnett, if I can. Oh, is he there somewhere? No, he's somewhere. I hope he's somewhere. Um, but I really hope that you'll listen uh, to him. There he is. I hope I, I'm sending him a request uh, because he's really doing great work. And I'm a big believer that we want to... There he is. Hi. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am doing good. It is an honor to to uh, to have this opportunity to speak with you today. Oh, well, I'm so uh, happy to be speaking with you. I was talking a little bit about you before you came on. Okay. And I have been watching your profile, listening to you, uh, and uh, I have to thank Charlemagne for telling me about you. He said, you know, you should check him out. And so oh, wow. I went, yeah, I went on to your um, Instagram and started listening to you and listening to your mission and your purpose and how you wanted to heal 
uh, black men and why you felt that that was important. And I've been super impressed by- Oh, wow, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, that, that, that is so humbling. Thank you. Oh, well, it's so true. So there you are. So tell me, Jay, how did you get into this? Why did you want to reach out and be a therapist for black men in particular? Uh, so w w one of the reasons um, when I started going to therapy, Maria, oh, probably about 10 years ago after football, um, for one, there, there were no black male therapists that I knew of at the time. And wow. most definitely there wasn't any individuals that I knew that were involved in some form of mental health, uh, and especially from that aspect of actually sitting down and speaking with a counselor. And my counselor at the time was a, a white guy who uh, who was very good. And I remember the first day uh, sitting down talking with him and us kind of going through, you know, the tell me what's going on, you know, kind of share your life with me type of thing. And I remember being very uncomfortable because I'm just kind of like, I'm not going to tell this white guy about my business. <laughs> so yeah. so it was it was very uncomfortable. And if you've seen the movie Antoine Fisher, my journey was just like that. So it took about three sessions for me to open up. But what opened me up is when he asked me about football. And so he asked me about what was it like to get to the NFL and not really have the career uh, that you wanted and for things not to uh, happen the way you wanted to. And tears began to just pour down my face. And I was just kind of like, man, dude, football has been everything. It, it's been... It's been my protector, it's been my shield, it's been my heart. And I was just like, I, I, I'd broken down like a little boy. And when he opened that door for me to start talking about football and we began to peel back the layers. And when he began to peel back the layers, I wanted to know more about myself and know more about my journey within my own stuff that I was dealing with. So I'm the son of a pastor. My parents had got divorced when I was 13 and I had most of my life wanted to be accepted by my father. And one of the reasons that I wanted to get to the NFL and, and make it because I got there, it was really that I wanted to show him that I can be who he wasn't. So I didn't want it for the right reasons. So when, when, when that door closed, here I was left to try to figure out who was I after football. So kind of going through that journey and, and for most who follow me and know my story, um, I attempted suicide twice, and the second time was a drug overdose. And when I survived that, I realized, okay, I need help. And so I went back into therapy and went back into unpacking and to really dig deep, like, what was the root of my depression and what was the root of why I would commit such harm uh, and why was I so disruptive to myself? And after going through my journey uh, about four years after that incident, uh, I was mentoring young kids in group homes and foster care. And I had created this program called Emotional Recovery Program that's similar to an emotional intelligence, like emotional IQ yeah. type of program. And so I created this program and the uh, foster homes and group homes in, in Houston was just like, man, these programs are opening these kids up. These kids Beautiful. are talking... Yeah, these kids were talking more to me than they were to their caseworkers. So the director, who was a black woman, she called me in her office and she said, you're doing the work of a therapist. And I was calling it mentoring. I said, oh, I'm just mentoring these kids. And she says, no, you're doing the work of a therapist. And so she said, do you ever consider like we're going to school and getting your credentials for this? I was like, lady, I'm 33 years old. I'm not going back to school to do anything. So, so I went wow. home and I prayed about it. I wow. prayed about it. And just as we're talking, I heard the voice of God said, go. So I went, I applied within, I, I got accepted. I went through the interview process. And to be honest, Maria, from the first day that I took a class on general studies and family therapy, I knew that's where I was supposed to be because it began to answer a lot of questions that I had within my own family system. And from there, uh, God began to speak to me even more about the work that I was gonna do. So five years to date from him speaking to me up until like um, 
like March of 2020, when the pandemic happened five years ago from that date, he said something is coming and your voice and your gift is going to be needed. This is so incredible because I love that, first of all, that you're so strong to be so vulnerable because in my mind they go together, right? And it takes such uh, courage to actually tell your story and want to know more about your journey. We have such a vacuum of black therapists in this country, male or female, right? And, uh, and that it's so important to be able to share your journey with somebody that you feel understands your journey. And I was watching you on one of your posts and that you were saying that so many men, not just black men, but men in general feel that it's not manly, that it doesn't, it means you're not a man if you break down and cry, if you go to therapy. How do we get men to accept that they need help to want to understand themselves? Because you also said that so much of the havoc, particularly in the black community, comes from black men. So women are wounded by it and it just goes generationally. Yeah. <laughs> Woo, yeah, you, you, you compile a lot in there, but this yeah, is good. I mean, uh, I, I answer the first question. One of the things is for men is really it's having a, not only the representation, but having the visual aids for men to see it. And one of the reasons why uh, my, my partner and co-host for uh, our show, The King's Table, Marcus Smith, who's a former NFL player as well. One of the things is, is that we want to showcase through our show, not only just men talking, but also men discovering solutions. Also, men discovering what does processing your stuff looks like? How do we conceptualize depression? How do we conceptualize anxiety? And even talk about abuse, because a lot of men have endured a lot of sexual abuse. And I think the more that we uh, have spaces for men to see other men open up, it actually give other men to courage and not only allow them to, to, to feel it, but allow them to see that they're not the only one. So it works, it works the same as sports. I use this analogy often, right? Michael Jordan never jumps from the free throw line if Dr. J never does it. So by Dr. J doing it, it in his mind, this was possible. So as the same as it works in the sports realm, it works in, in the life realm. The more men see other men like myself speaking about vulnerability, speaking about being broken, uh, speaking about having depression and dealing with these issues and not feeling that our masculinity is going to be questioned because most time men feel like they're going to be emasculated if they begin to speak about their wounds. And then also, I think this give a lot of men understanding and context that there's a difference between broken and being wounded. And I think a lot of men have been wounded, which caused brokenness which caused the perpetuated cycle of unhealthy behaviors and which that we see in relationship that causes unhealthy relationships. You talk, uh, Jay, a lot about the father wound. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, can you speak a little bit about that? You, you talked about men being abused, being wounded, and then you talk about the father wound. How do they all go together? Well, how they all go together. So I want to kind of give you a brief context uh, and it kind of layered. So let's talk about David for a second, right? We all know how David was this great king and how God called him and anointed him, right? But then also, we don't really know the backstory. And through my research and understanding the backstory of why was David not called on first when Samuel went to Jesse and asked him about his boys. So the context to it is that Jesse never wanted to have David. So in that, he never built a relationship with David. So they were always distanced. So what a father wound looks like is that David now had to seek validation in other areas. So where did he begin to seek validation first? From Saul. He finds out that Saul is trying to kill him. So the man that he looks up to is trying to kill him. What does this look like in today's society? When boys does not have the proper attention, healthy relationship with their fathers, they're looking for validation through sex. They're looking for validation through either the neighborhood drug boy, or they're looking for validation from a coach. They're looking for validation from all of these unhealthy spaces that never really feel the capacity and feels what they need. So they always have this void. 
And one of the things that I tell uh, when I'm working with girls, a man that does not know himself would seek validation between your legs. So because now his identity is in his male parts rather than in his head. So the father wound shows up when these men have rejection issues like David. David was rejected. So when you're rejected, you're constantly seeking to be accepted. And this even shows up in successful men, right? Yeah, I, I achieved awesome. the success. I yeah. got the money. So I was once rejected in this season. And now that I have money, what do I do? I've developed this very misogynistic mentality to where I don't respect women. I don't have any uh, 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 really space to really give. So I abuse my power. I abuse my relationships. And everything around me becomes very toxic. And that's what father wounds look like. Do, is, is that particular, you think, in the black and brown community? Or is that across men? Well, I, 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 think, I, I, think, I think it's across the board for men in general. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think, do we see, uh, and, and I'm not going to necessarily say that we see it a lot, but we see it a lot in men in power. Because it shows up in two different dynamics. It shows up in men who has power, and then it shows up in men do, that, that doesn't have a, a, a sense of identity. So when you don't have a sense of identity, you don't have a sense of your worth and your value. So what do you do? Like, so, so, so many women I talk to say, like, I can't get my husband or my partner to go to therapy, and I can't get them to communicate, or they have a bad temper, or I don't know what to do with them. And the more I suggest therapy, the madder they get. So if you're a mother, a partner, and you are with a man that you think needs therapy or that you think could benefit from therapy, what's the best way to go about doing that, you think? Well, one of the things is going back to that visual aid. Um, often when, when women come to me and they, you know, they're talking about them, uh, their sons and talking about their spouses, I always suggest, I said, hey, send him this video that I did on YouTube. So and they'll send their husband or their brother uh, this uh, video on YouTube okay. of me speaking about uh, brokenness or speaking about, you know, my own challenges, right? And what happened is it softens a part of them up. And so these men are able to see another man who represent masculinity, who's a former athlete. So it, it connects to him and say, oh, wow, if this guy can do it, then this kind of opens a space up for him. So I usually encourage women to kind of use visual aid, especially in the age of social media. Send a video, uh, send a podcast, or send something because Good what idea. it could feel like when the wife or the mom says, hey, why don't you talk to somebody? Why don't you go to therapy? It can sound like nagging. That's not what it is because most women are speaking from concern. But it, it, it also makes a lot of men feel like they're weak if they have to go talk to somebody. And so what my mission is, is that you can expose weakness by showing your strength and that your strength is how vulnerable you are. So I want men to understand is that vulnerability, it really reflects who you are as a man, more so than showing who you think you are when you don't talk. Wow, that's so beautiful. So if you want to look for that video, if you're out there and you're looking for, I love the idea of using visual aids uh, to um, so you don't come off as nagging because I I mean every woman I know has been called a nag at some point yeah. uh, <laughs> in her life and I think it's true it's you know coming the way you look at it coming from a place of concern whether you're a mother a sister a wife a spouse whatever you are coming from a place of concern and help so having a visual aid having a man who looks like you talk about these things changes the perception right and so you're also talking a lot to young men because you're saying to young men if we don't heal young men they will become toxic men they will become abusers they may end up in prison they may end up abusing somebody they love what kind of reception are you getting in this time we have so many young people depression anxiety suicides way up from the pandemic loss of jobs it's a brutal time out there, right? Are you hopeful about what you're seeing? Yes, Maria, I'm very hopeful about what I'm seeing. Uh, I was just in Amarillo Health Symposium and um, I, I did the illustration with the uh, three young men. There was a, a young white kid and there was a, um, I think, a biracial kid and there was a black kid. And then I brought up two white 
male officers. And when I gave this illustration of everyone having their own trauma and carrying their own burden and cross through the things that they have experienced, what it did was it neutralized it for the men in the entire room. Because what happened is it didn't matter if you were white, didn't matter if you were black, didn't matter what your job specification, your job title, or what your financial status or social status was, we all have endured some form of trauma at some point. But as I began to share my story, you could, I, there was young men sitting in the, off, in the uh, audience that began to cry because I made it okay for them to not be okay. The most unhealthy and dysfunctional things that a lot of us have taken on, because I took it on when my parents divorced, I felt that I had to be the man of the house. And when boys have to be the man of the house, this is not only taking away his childhood, this is also taking away his process to develop as a young boy. So if you know anything about the frontal lobe of the brain, it's in development from ages 10 to about 25. So if you speed that process up where this child skips the adolescent stage of development and he goes right into the man stage, right, of feeling like I got to provide, I got to be this, and I have to be that. What you're doing is you're putting a child in the thought process of a male when he has not developed the thinking ability to manage a thought that he needs to be a man. So in that, when I began to break these things down and really see these young men kind of open up, and I look at all of them, you know, and I tell them, it's okay. And most of these young boys, and I've worked with white, black, Asian, all types of young men. The moment I said, man, it's okay to cry, the tears just fall. Because for the first time, they've been affirmed by a man. For the first time, a man has embraced them with respect. I didn't talk down on them. I'm not talking over their head. I'm not talking at them. I am talking to them. They open up. And here's the thing that helps all of these young men to feel open is they feel safe. Yeah because I'm not going to take what they share and use it against them. And I'll be honest, my biggest fear today as a man who has been on my healing journey and, and, and have gone through my process, my biggest fear at times is being open and feeling like I'm going to have to deal with uh, e emotional blackmail or feel like what I share, share is going to be used against me. And that's what most boys and men fear. That's so uh, beautifully said. Wow. Several people have said, ask the, what is the video that you're talking about that they should show on YouTube? Oh, yes, absolutely. So I have a video on uh, YouTube on the Dear Future Wifey podcast, and it's uh, called Heal, Bro, Heal. So Heal, it's called, Broke, Heal. Yeah, Heal, Bro, Heal. So a lot, uh, short for brother. Okay, Heal, Broke, Heal. So we can, yeah. yeah. He'll broke heel, right? Yes. Okay, so we'll we'll link to that uh, when we post this up in the Sunday paper. So, what? So, kind of visual aid, giving a safe space, and I love the idea of like don't emotionally blackmail somebody who shares their emotions, their vulnerability, their story with you. That requires the listener to really guard the information that they're kind of being honored with, right? Absolutely. That's a really big push. So when you, so for people who, you know, for men to have a safe space, the person they're kind of sharing their vulnerability with also has a huge responsibility. Yeah, a huge responsibility. And that responsibility is to listen from a place of understanding rather than a place of responding. Because sometimes when it comes to men, uh, there are times where I'm not looking for feedback or rebuttal or commentary. I'm just looking to be heard. Uh, and, I'll, and, I, and I'll be even more transparent. Uh, me and my mother were having a conversation once, and, and I had to tell her, I said, Mom, I'm not calling you so you can tell me what you think I should do. And I said, I just want you to listen to me. And my sister kind of butted into the conversation and she says, mom, can you just hear him for once? 
That's all I wanted to do. I wanted to be heard. And one of the things was is that, you know, when, when men don't feel heard, what we do is we clam up. We clam up and we become very withdrawn. When we withdraw, we become very um, socially abandoned. What well, was what I like to call is, is social abandonment. We stop growing in life. We stop caring about ourselves. We stop giving attention to our health because depression looks different in men and in women. Because yeah, so Jay, just real quickly, so if somebody's in a relationship or as a mother and somebody, uh, they have a son or they have a partner who is depressed, what does it look like in a man? I'll tell you what it looks like in a man. It's extreme silence. It's extreme silence. He's very silent. He's very withdrawn. Um, he's very, uh, he's, uh, sometimes it feels like he's very dismissive um, because when men are in a state of process, we process through being quiet. Most women process through talking, right? You know, you have girl time, you're going to have your wine, you're going to process, you're going to talk, you're going to have uh, discussions. But men, when we're in a state of depression, we are very silent. Because most of the times, we don't know how to process what our thoughts are. And one of the things that I do with a lot of my male clients is when we are in something deep and we're unpacking, I often tell them just to sit there, just sit in this right quick. And as they're sitting, I just want them to be still and to give their mind time to not try to find an answer, but to feel it. Because see, when for men, we're not taught to feel. We're taught to ignore the feeling and go straight to a solution. But if you're in real therapy and you're seeking real healing, you're not looking for a solution. You're looking to work through the process of discovering the solution. That's and so beautiful. You have to really want, I think it's, you want to be curious about yourself and you want to have to heal. Yes. There's some women here saying, you know, I'm also process depression and silence and uh, I think it's not that he's saying you don't. He was just describing how men, because so often we think, um, you know, men have the same um, qualities or they exhibit the same qualities as women. And I'm always a big believer in saying it doesn't process the same. Depression, anxiety doesn't look the same in a woman as a man. And he's describing um, what it looks like, particularly in a man. And so as a mother of two boys and a sister of four, guys, that's a really helpful thing to go like, okay, wow, that I might have just thought that they were quiet. I wouldn't have thought that maybe that was depression, or I maybe can't see anxiety the same in my son as perhaps in my daughter. Right. And you know, another thing too, uh, Maria, is that for a lot of men, a lot of men are programmed to say that they're okay. Yeah. A lot of men are programmed to say I'm good. And there's guys that I work with. I mentor a lot of young athletes. And they'll reach out and text, hey, Jay, what's good? And before we get into deep conversation, I'll say, how are you doing? And <laughs> you'd be surprised of the guys that'll say, hey, Mr. Jay, you got a minute? <laughs> and so because what I did was I just neutralized the playing field that I don't want to talk about what you have going on because we all do it, men and women. We yes. all have this mask on yeah. because we're trying to mask and hide from people actually seeing us for who we really are and for what's really going on inside of us. Notice how the most of us, when we're asked how we're doing or what's going on, we begin to tell people about all the stuff that we're doing. Oh, I just got a raise at my job. The kids are, you know, doing good in school. My husband is good. My wife is doing good. We're just trying to push through COVID. And it's like, it's almost like this program response that nobody wants to say, hey, I'm not doing good, man. Yeah, and absolutely. The more, I love the that. More, the more, the, Christina for me. My daughter wanted me to ask a question. I forgot what was it exactly. Oh, Oh, yeah. So her, my daughter's question, which is really great, is how can we collectively, you know, help young black men, people of color, or young men in general? Well, one of the ways that we can start, so, and, and, and which is so important for the work that I'm doing, you think about it, right? Um, 
in 2000 and in, 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 in 2015, 86% of the psychologists were white. You got 86% of psychologists are white. You got 5% that are Asian American. You got 5% are Hispanic. And then right about 4% were black. So in that space, you only have 4% of black psychologists, or I mean psychologists that are working in the mental health field. Now let's look at this disparity, right? Blacks make up 12% in the US population and they account for about 19% of mental health issues and disorders. Huge disparity. So how individuals can come together collectively is for us to understand what does PTSD look like in a black man and in a black woman because it looks completely different in our counterparts or in a white male or white female. It's also educating each other that depression in a black man may not be the fact that he is um, uh, uh, overeating because that's the symptom, right? You begin to overeat or you have a loss of appetite. Maybe depression in a young black male is that he's very disruptive in class. You know, maybe depression in a young black male means that he's self-harming because for years, for years, you only heard about suicide and suicide ideation and all those different things being something that was in a white community. Yeah. But for the, those that are watching, I want to alarm them. Study shows from the CDC, the third leading cause in young black males ages 14 to 24 is suicide. Right, and those numbers have gone up in the past. And they're, going, and they're going up. And, uh, and I'm glad that you said that because the age has dropped from 14 to 12. So when we are working with young black males and working with young black females in the healthcare mental health system, there's a huge challenge for those that are working with them to have an understanding what's going on in their family dynamics. Yeah, absolutely. Because a lot of time, it's not that it's a bad kid. Sometimes it's the dynamic of the family situation that's causing these this child behavior to be manifested from the fact that ain't the lights are off yeah I'm not I think that night. all of these things are what you're saying is to ask questions to be open to listening you don't have to have all the answers no allowing somebody to not be okay uh paying attention uh to people's emotions recognizing perhaps when someone is you know, not themselves. Uh, and this is the work, right, to my daughter's point was, what can we all do? We can all start paying attention. Yes, paying attention. We can all start listening. Um, we can hold space. We can refrain from emotional blackmail, which is really a beautiful and really important point, that if somebody gives us the honor of sharing their most vulnerable secrets and stuff that we don't throw it back in their face at any time. And also to promote, uh, you know, that this is a career that's a valid, uh, honorable, successful career to be a black therapist. I love what you said to kind of bring it to sports, that so many people think about what's my life after the NFL. Look at you. Yeah, yes. I mean, it's an incredible thing. And you thought it was mentoring and so, yeah. and so to kind of encourage people like, wow, I can take those skills in sports and psychology and I can bring them to my community and I can change lives and I can get men uh, to help them heal themselves, which in turn, as you said in another thing, changes the entire community. Absolutely. And, and I mean, as you so eloquently uh, stated, that is taking what you've been giving. And one of the things that I've realized is that I started speaking in my dad's church when I was 10 years old. And what I realized, and I told my professor this, I said, I refuse to be a therapist that sit behind a desk and just work in the office and see clients. And he says, well, Jay, what's wrong with that? I said, I don't think anything is wrong with it. I just think that I have a lot more to offer. I said, I have a gift to connect with people that I haven't seen. My parents, you know, my mom tell me all the time, because I remember when I was in therapy and my mom said, you're going to this white man and you're telling this white man all your business. I said, I don't care what color he is. I'm just trying to get some help. <laughs> so, so, so it didn't, it didn't matter to me. You know, it, it didn't matter what his race was. <laughs> I was trying to get some help. 
Mothers. So, Mothers. And so, <laughs> so, so I, <laughs> for me, so great. Yeah. you know, and for, for me, it's just been, um, it's been very humbling because I'll be honest with you, Maria, even when we look at the DSM, right? The DSM is on its fifth volume, it's on volume five. And for those who don't know, it's a diagnostic statistic manual uh, that we're able to determine mental disorders and different uh, uh, diseases and, uh, and things of that nature. But even as when it comes down to the DSM, there were no black psychiatrists that were involved in writing that. So a lot of times wow. there have been so many issues where uh, young black kids have been misdiagnosed or they've been overdiagnosed. You have a lot of black males who've been diagnosed with schizophrenia and it was just depression. And so you have these young boys that are on medication that is changing the wiring of their brain, is changing the function of their biochemical system that is shifting not only their thought process, but it's yeah. shifting their whole DNA makeup. Because believe it or not, mental health impacts every part of your life. And what I want young brothers and men to understand that mental health is so important because when you can stabilize your mental, your physical and your emotional well-being, this is going to determine the quality of life that you live. But it's also going to determine the quality of life that you lead. What type of life are you leading for yourself? What type of life are you leading for your family? And when we talk about protecting the black woman and protecting black women, we have to start with black boys and black men. Because the moment that I see value in myself, I see value in my sister. I see value in people. And I tell young men this all the time. I have yet to see a man who love himself abuse his wife, his girlfriend, his sister, or abuse anything. Whenever there's no uh, identity for self and value, abuse is inevitable. Wow. I'm going to leave it there. That is so profound. I want to keep talking to you because uh, I hope we'll do this again. I think Absolutely. what you're doing is so great. And I want you to know I, I, I watch your stuff. And, and in my bed so at night, and I watch it, and I think what you're doing is really important, and I think it's really profound, and I think it's really courageous. Thank you, and, thank you so uh, much. I'm uh, I'm so glad that Charlemagne told me to go check you out, and uh, I'm honored that we had this yes. conversation. And no, I'm honored as well. I, I mean, I've watched you, you know, for years, and the great work that you've <laughs> Don't done tell as me a journalist you since you were a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, so I, I am just humble, you know what I mean? When, you know, my manager was saying, like, yo, Maria Shiver, you know, Shriver wants to interview you. I was just like, oh, my God. And it's just been, you know, humbling to be supported by you and to be supported by Charlemagne the God. And so this, this is just humbling. So thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. God bless you. And have thank a great you. week. Keep up the good work. Right. Thank and you. Thank you all so much for joining us for this really important uh, conversation about how we can collectively help uh, one another, how we can do a better job of listening, how we can do a better job of holding space and uh, holding uh, the information that those in our lives share with us. And I thought that was really beautiful. And so if you, uh, I hope if you have a man in your life or, or anybody in your life, right, stay open, keep your eyes open, keep your mind open, keep your heart open, and um, just take the time to listen. So thank you. Uh, hi, Matt Braverman. How are you? Um, I want to thank him. Please follow him. Um, he really does some interesting stuff, and it's really quite powerful. Yeah, follow King J. Barnett. Thank you. Follow King J. Barnett, and um, he's really good. So we'll put this up in the Sunday paper and um, we'll talk to him. We'll keep talking to him because I think he's doing really interesting stuff. So thank you all. Happy hump day. You're almost to Friday. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.